Jessica Bohr. Uh, I'd like to cover Chapter 9, Knowledge Management and E-Learning. Um, this is an interesting chapter because we're going to talk about intellectual capital, knowledge management within an organization, human behavior regarding knowledge management, and then move into e-learning and talk about learning management system, which Canvas is a learning management system, and gee whiz, how timely is this? The entire university has moved to an e-learning platform. And then we want to talk about corporate versus educational a little bit. So the basis for all this is what we call intellectual capital. And we're basically talking about organizations or countries or whatever at this point. So intellectual capital is the kind of the collective knowledge of a company or a country. And it's an asset for production, development of new products, and the marketing of those new products, and the production thereof. I mean, a company with lots of intellectual capital is obviously Apple. And it distinguishes successful organizations from those that are less successful. Other companies are just slapping products together and launching them. Now, the innovator, like uh, Sony was an innovator in consumer electronics in the, in the 60s and 70s, was the market leader. They were the big, bold, new idea company. They were the Apple then. But then there were some companies called Fast Followers, Panasonic being one of them, that would take every innovation that Sony came up with and quickly adapt to, modify, and produce for less the same product, usually with the same degree of quality. So could you say that even though Sony had greater intellectual capital than Panasonic, you couldn't say Sony was necessarily more successful, even though you don't see any Panasonic products and you still see Sony products today. So what are the types of, of, of intellectual capital? We have uh, human capital, structural capital, and social capital. And the human capital is the competencies and knowledges of, uh, of the organization's employees. The social capital is the number and quality of the relationships the organization's uh, employees maintain. Um, and structural capital is the knowledge and stored documentation about the business. And structural capital becomes in this kind of intellectual capital becomes more important because you know people don't stay with the companies forever. Uh, it used to be when I first started working that there was a guy there that was a guru of this, that, and the other thing, and they stayed at the company for a long time. But that's no longer the case. People move, and you want to still retain the capital within the company. There's a couple types of knowledge. There's explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge. Explicit is um, the facts and figures. Uh, it's the data, the dates, the times, the uh, formulas, the formulations. Tacit knowledge is judgment, more involved in uh, uh, judgment and how things are done and taking that explicit knowledge and new input and being able to, to drive new intellectual capital from that to make better decisions based on that. A tacit knowledge is what, you know, a lot of people in a company will see, you know, one, one of my backgrounds was always working in quality management. One of the tenets of quality management is you want to have actions based on um, facts, uh, numbers, and, and data facts and data drive your decision making because if you can have the facts and you have data to support it you're probably making a better decision a lot of people will see a seasoned older uh, executive apparently shooting from the hip and try to emulate him because after all it's a country of cowboys and not be successful because they don't have that tacit knowledge that, that oftentimes comes with the experience 
So if we look at knowledge management, uh, there's um, some steps that you want to do. And it's almost like an implementation step. If you want to create this for your company, identify the goal, locate the sources, capture the knowledge, organize and share value uh, knowledge. So let's, let's begin, let's go through this. So the first thing is identify the goal. And they actually don't have a slide for this and it's absolutely the most important part. Why are you doing it? What expectations do you have in, in doing it? So don't start a project like this. Don't start you know, an intellectual or a knowledge management system. It has to be in a certain area. Um, I had an idea once uh, that I half developed to keep basically a new product development database on an ongoing basis so you could always be updating it. And the reason I wanted to do that is, especially in consumer products, where uh, the voice of the customer is not often paid attention to and the voice of the customer changes. So if it's not paid attention to and it's changing, uh, it's a harder target to hit. Plus, if you find out how to translate the voice of the customer into things you can actually produce and the attributes that drive the product, the, the design parameters of the product and the manufacturing parameters of the product, you want to preserve that knowledge in a way that when you have this mix of marketing directors and, uh, and product managers uh, moving and so quickly that there's not always a new learning curve they can actually sit on top of a database that they can use and how do you bring that database to place. Uh, I was never able to convince a company to do that, but it's a research project that's still in the back of my mind. Um, so where do you find the, the expert locations in the system? Uh, so you want to find out how do I find experts and what's my social network analysis, who's doing it best, who's not doing it best, and in this day and age when uh, companies are collaborating all over the world, this becomes a huge kind of issue. So if you look at uh, the sources of this kind of uh, structural capital, it's your information system, it's your intranet, it's employee manuals, handbooks, operating manuals, all those kinds of things. But where do you find the expertise? The expertise is all over the company. Uh, I remember once it was way back in the 80s. We were looking at... Uh, just starting to have engineers in this um, company that we worked for that made uh, transfer cases and uh, rear axles for trucks. They had, and, and all of that is really mechanical engineering and really gear engineering. And uh, uh, the guru of gear design, they had a, a patented gear design, was about to retire. And there was no way of how do we capture his knowledge? How do we maintain that? How do we spread that knowledge to other people? How do we create the manual that people could use? Back then, all we were interested in was creating a manual. But now we have to do something different. Now we have all this IT systems. We have uh, social networks, everything behind us to help drive this. So getting the, the individuals integrated into these informal networks is important, but we also want to find out how to map them together and how to create an environment where all their knowledge can be captured and they can collaborate. And, you know, basically what you're trying to do is if you have uh, knowledge um, experts based around the world, you want to have the, the, the equation at one plus one plus one is greater than five not equal to three. Uh, one way, here's an example of the textbook uses is this uh, um, NOAA, I think it's a, let's see, how do we say it? It's the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration of the federal government. And it's a tremendous source. The federal government has done a beautiful job of creating masses of data that everybody can um, go to. If I want to find out 
the history of almond sales in the San Joaquin Valley. Those of you that had uh, microeconomics with me know that that's something I look at. But the Department of Agriculture keeps that data. And sometimes it's easy to find, sometimes it's not. I think the search algorithms that are used are not the best sometimes in the government. And even with Google on top of it, it's still not the best. But it's there's data at your fingertips that you can get to. And oftentimes, when I've looked at certain data in uh, the government databases, there's a phone number, someone you can call, actually picks up the phone, and you can speak intelligently. You're the person that actually put the data together and can give you more insight, maybe even send you more information. So this is a perfect example of this um, building your knowledge database and keeping track of it. And you use wikis and all kinds of other file structures uh, to do this. Uh, you could do the same thing if you organized it with um, a Dropbox or Box.com or Microsoft OneDrive, uh, structuring it together. But you really want to organize it in a uh, kind of a proprietary website. Now, you have to watch out if the website gets hacked into. Your secrets are everybody's. But on the other hand, maybe you just um, you create it the old-fashioned way. You make a manual and you share that, but that can be copied as well. So if we organize and share and value knowledge, so one of the things we want to do, let's go back here. If you're talking about how do you capture, what's a strategy for capturing and 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 getting that, that knowledge, either explicit or tacit, um, there's a variety of things. One is called benchmarking. It's a very old quality management tool. It's not covered in a book. But basically, it's like find out how someone else is doing it. And, and people are willing to share with you, especially if they're in organizations that aren't competing with you. They're proud to tell you some of the things they do. They're not going to give you trade secrets away or give you trade secrets, but they're willing to share generally how they do things. And if it applies to you, Beg, borrow, and steal. Um, imitation is the uh, greatest form of flattery. There's something called an after-action review. The Army developed this. And basically, every time they did something, they did an operation, they would do an after-action review to say what went well, what didn't go well, what went as planned, what were unforeseen issues that caused the plan not to work. If we were ever to do this again, what did we learn from this and how, do we, how would we adapt what we did? And that's also a great thing to do. And not enough organizations take that seriously. Uh, they're too, they high five and you know, celebrate a team victory or almost victory and don't do this after action review. Uh, so best practice is something else, uh, bench, uh, which is close to benchmarking. Um, you know, you can keep a website, a wiki, that adds and edit articles about specific topics, which I do myself. I kind of have a study going on um, e-commerce, and I use it for my marketing channels and supply chain class. You can shadow people. You can, uh, it's kind of a mentoring strategy. So if we decide that uh, employee A needs to shadow employee B as employee B is getting ready to retire and then employee B can mentor employee A and bring them along and share that corporate lore and knowledge with them. You can have a community of best practice which is uh, basically a group of individuals with common interests who share the knowledge because they are in the same profession or job and you would create that within your own organization. There are a variety of blogs out there and in fact, I find some of the best knowledge I'm getting if I'm researching something can be from a blog because it's not um, a tome of reading to do. It's short little snippets so you can get little insights. You can always read a book. You can always read a, a, a deeper um, academic treatise. Um, and team workspaces. If teams are collected, you know, wiki, a wiki and it is, is an electronic version of a team workspace where you have bulletin boards and whiteboards and a common work area and all of that stuff. That's still very powerful, but it can be emulated very much uh, if you have a global team through the use of the technologies like the recently uh, uh, adapted by North Park Microsoft Teams, which I think is fantastic. 
So you want to organize, share, and value the knowledge. So if it's, you know, if you look at the value of the information, low-level nuisance, redundant information, heck with it. You don't need that. You don't even have to save it. If it's compliance information, that's stuff that you have to do. It's usually something government-related that says, we have to be able to do this to comply. It follows certain laws. So this is a must-be. You have to make sure that you collect and have traceable data in that regard. And if I'm thinking about compliance from a quality assurance standpoint, you want to do exactly what it says here, automate, automate collection and archiving to achieve cost-effectiveness of this data. And also, if you ever have to do a recall, if you have the data collected and uh, properly organized, you can minimize what has to be recalled because you have good data of and traceability of what period of production may have actually needs to be recalled. If you don't have that kind of thing, the federal government will make you recall a larger swath and it becomes way more expensive. Operational information. Well, organizations thrive and, uh, and, and exist and strive and excel on data. The best operations people I, I ever knew always knew their numbers. And they had a book of numbers. If we're talking about operation, we're talking about uh, the day-to-day -day running of a company, the manufacturing, the planning, the sales, the accounting, all of that stuff that the COO runs of the company. That's the operational information. The better organized that is, the better your measurements are, the more you can know if something you did actually made an improvement or if something you did had an impact positively or negatively. So that's, that's critical. Uh, so you want to also systematically uh, collect, organize, and then interpret that data, I would say, as well. Um, you want to make sure, like they say here, wide availability throughout the organization to those who need to have the information. Not everybody needs to have all the information, but people that need it should have it. And they should be able to interpret it quickly and effectively and know what it means. And oftentimes, if you have operational data and something goes uh, surprisingly well positive or disappointingly falls off a cliff, you know, uh, you have some negative performance, there's like 10 questions that uh, your boss or your boss's boss is going to ask. You want to have those, the data to dig deeper into it at your fingertips. And then strategically valuable information. Um, you know, the world is changing at a rapid pace. How do you, you know, who your competitors now, who your competitors are going to be in the future? Uh, what channels do you reach your customers through now? What channels will you reach your customers through later? Um, what are your customer needs today? Who, who are your customers tomorrow? And what will they want? Uh, who are, you know, your competitors today may be local. They may be, but they tomorrow they may be global competitors. Probably already today they are global competitors. Who will they be tomorrow? Which global competitors will survive? Which won't? Having all of that kind of not there's a lot of tacit knowledge in this part. You have facts, you have data, but you also have a lot of judgment in this part. And that judgment has to get refined and improved as one gets more information as the future unfolds, basically. So there's a human element, of course, too, right? It's humans that are driving all of this. Um, what do, do humans actually do why do they, do they want to share knowledge or do they have a self-interest in not sharing knowledge um i've noticed that and, and i'm relating this to my background many manufacturing people like to keep everybody the heck out of their sandbox because when something goes wrong in manufacturing every finance person every marketing person every c-level executive is all of a sudden an expert in operations and supply chain management it just and they aren't, but they think they can be. And if things go wrong in the supply chain or operations, oftentimes 
It has something to do with marketing and sales dropping the ball, but it always comes to operations. So the operations people say, okay, we have lots of knowledge. I'm going to keep it to myself. I'm going to keep my, my best data inside. I'm going to report what I have to report, but stay out of my sandbox, basically. So that's kind of like a negative side of it. Organizations are trying to get to the point now that, listen, uh, all this data is in a system. It should be available to whoever needs it. And we've got to start getting people to not be protective of things, not put spin on things, and use um, this data to make everybody work better. So you're looking for people with more of a team-faced uh, uh, approach and, and not so much self-interest, but everybody certainly wants to get uh, promoted. Everybody wants to do well. But I think, you know, by... It, it, I think if you can use data and information and knowledge to make one and one be more than two or one plus one plus one be more than three, and you're the kind of person that can facilitate that to happen and make teams function better through the use of shared data and information, I think there's a tremendous value in that. And that's what a lot of organizations are hopefully moving to. Now, this is tied in with the culture of the company, too. Some companies have a very cutthroat, I win, you lose. Other companies have a, hey, come on, let's, we're all in this together. Let's row the boat in the same direction, and uh, everybody wins. So what are the, the incentives here? Um, if we talk about, well, influence sharing, certainly something that we want to do. And we want to avoid the unintended consequences, or if we have any unintended consequences, we'd love to have them be positive. The reason they're unintended, unintended consequences is because we can't often predict what's going to happen. And then we want to have guidelines, uh, rules, as much as we can to play fair. This is situational, I'm guessing in that not one set of rule books is going to apply everywhere in a company and certainly not across companies. So what are the guidelines that you want to have? There's probably best practices you want to look at to sharing this information. Now, on the other hand, I've seen knowledge databases that accumulate data and then people just don't tap into it or they forget it's there. So there has to be an ease of use and there has to be a, a way to reference it. I mean, think about this. I have a file cabinet at home of all my papers from wherever. I actually don't have such a thing, but if I did, you know, think 30, 40 years ago. And now I take all of that stuff and I've organized it as I really have, for the most part, in my hard drive. And my hard drive the stuff that I use on a frequent basis is either in Dropbox on my hard drive on my one of my machines and definitely either in Box as a backup or Dropbox. So I have this information wherever I am, wherever I want to look it up. And sometimes I'm really surprised at how organized and how I can find things very quickly. And other times I'm, I thought I had more information on something than I actually do. Actually, I use Evernote, too, as my notebook for, for clipping articles and keeping things. So, And it's easy for it to get out of hand, so you've got to have some sort of structure to manage it. Um, content issues. So what are we talking about here? Uh, we're talking about, you know, sometimes it's just keeping track of things. Like LinkedIn is a great knowledge basis. I mean, it's Facebook for working people, but it's also the ultimate Rolodex. There used to be a saying in the 60s and 70s when I first started working that said, wow, he really has a, a, a great Rolodex. And a Rolodex used to be a, a card filing system that basically was an address book. And if you had a great Rolodex, it means you knew people in your company and other companies that you could call on and ask questions. And it was your kind of your knowledge 
your extended um, human capital database that you could tap into. And you would know, oh, you're looking for a job. You know, my son's looking for a job in this. And someone with a good Rolodex could say, hey, listen, I know the vice president of blah, blah, blah at uh, uh, XYZ company that would your son should talk to. It would be great networking. And maybe he could get a job or he at least get reference to another job from this guy. Well, that's been replaced. Everybody has a great Rolodex now. It's called LinkedIn. You get a premium uh, a membership and you're like an HR professional. If you maintain and keep your contacts going, and there's some debate, should you have, should you know all of your contacts well, or do you want a wider web? It doesn't, I don't know. You can argue one way or the other. So that's one way of doing it. But then some technology is complicated. I mean, if we're talking about the databases of people that are uh, studying coronaviruses and sharing that database, because right now across the world they should be sharing the database and trying to come up with um, treatments and or vaccines, that's really complicated. You and I could get access to that database and that knowledge information system, but we don't know anything about it. And I guess there's some, you got to determine, and it's more art sometimes than it is science, on how much content you want, how you want to organize the content, uh, which content is important or not. And I don't know, should you go through and eliminate things at some point? I don't know. My uh, Evernote, where I clip articles, I've kind of got it organized into all kinds of Areas There's probably stuff that I'll probably never read again, but there's articles that I look up all the time. And if I do a search on my own, I can go into my own article database and search for an article on supply and demand. Uh, or I could look on something for quality or quality improvement and come up with uh, articles that have been, you know, in the past couple of years and therefore relevant to students. What's the semantic web? Um, we're talking about a web with meaning. So managing knowledge on the web involves what they call building a semantic web. Uh, what they call a web with meaning. It's an online resource in which relationships can be read and understood by computers relying on machine language. Well, I guess that's one thing that you would like to look at. You'd like to be able to search through that. And it's really a depository for all kinds of infor information, and it's kind of halfway in between probably AI and um, just a file system. So the semantic web, according to the book, relies on what they call resource description framework, or RDF, to describe the resources and their properties. So it's written in XML, which we've talked about already, and um, and was developed by the, the consortium of basically the internet, the World Wide Web Consortium, they call it. And it's a resource and its properties like a, it describes resources and properties like a sentence. So you find me reading from the textbook here, so that the actual relationship between the parts and the sentence can be understood. Um, so a resource description framework, RDF, and you look at some futuristic frameworks to that. So when we're talking about the practical tips involved here, identify a clear and specific goal, start small. Get management buy-in for the project. Find assets and human experts in the organization that can help start up the knowledge and knowledge database. And populate with the, the information that you need. Make sure it's accurate, up to date. Uh, you probably want an administrator that uh, helps sift through and uh, and maybe it's done collectively. I think Wikipedia is a, a, a fine example of that on some large scale of people that work together and contribute and add to and subtract from articles. And sometimes you get fake news in there, but most of the time it's a good start to do things. And there's always references in most good Wikipedia articles that if you read the article and want to know more, you can go to more detailed uh, areas 
so I like Wikipedia, even though I don't like relying on Wikipedia sources so much. I usually allow people to have one in a paper. I don't want to have more. But if you find a Wikipedia source that you like, there's all kinds of references that are referenced in the Wikipedia article that you can then read and then they're probably more accurate uh, or maybe first source articles. Uh, you, they're saying choose a technology that's simple and user-friendly and it integrates easily with the existing systems. Yeah, sure, of course. You, a system that's easier to use even for a complex technology that you're maybe creating a knowledge database for is important. Um, and there, and always, I always believe in this. Start with a pilot project, show that it's a success, do an after action review so people know the pitfalls and what to do and how to even make it better and then help roll it out to other areas. I would say I would let management prioritize the areas that you want to start it in and which they think may be of strategic value to the company. But you can develop it locally too. Um, develop knowledge, uh, you know, what's the incentive for sharing? And, you know, however that goes. Because, you know, people like to keep their, sometimes people keep their data to themselves. Data is power. With ERP systems, less so than it used to be. And you want to encourage people to participate, make improvements, and add to the organization's collective intellectual capital. Now let's segue into e-learning, which is timely because the whole campus has moved to that. It's uh, It can be self-paced, it can be instructor-led, or it can be a hybrid where it's um, part face-to-face, -face, part online, and there's so many different models. So we should, we should be looking at some of these. When you do course development, you should have a subject matter expert. Um, and this is, again, we're talking about organizational uh, courses, but I'm going to probably use the higher ed model and the corporate model kind of toggling between the two. You always want a subject matter expert. Well, in the university, it's a professor. In um, an organization, in a business, it's a person that knows most about the subject or a lot about the subject. You want an instructional designer. What is an instructional designer? Um, that, that used to only exist in corporations, in the departments of education, usually in uh, the HR departments. But now it's expanded, especially with e-learning, into it's become a field all by itself and into higher ed as well. The uh, Center for Online Education at North Park does that. They have instructional designers. And what they do is make sure they, they understand um, in the corporations, they understand about adult learning and how adults learn. And it's, uh, you know, not subjecting you to a 45-minute lecture like this one is, but you only have to watch 10 minutes at a time. You don't have to watch the whole thing. And what works and what doesn't work, what mix of video and what mix of exercise and what kinds of exercise and online discussions and all those kinds of things that Professor Papademus and I have kind of like, I don't know, glued together here into a course that kind of sort of works. And online, I think it'll probably even work even better. Uh, in the organization, you need a project sponsor and a project manager because you're rolling out an education program in an organization, in a, in a business for a specific purpose. Um, the way that you manage these in universities is your course, obviously, if you're coming up with a new course or you want to take a course from a regular platform to an e-learning platform, has to be improved by your own department and then maybe by your school, and then approved by the entire faculty, and somehow blessed by the Center of Online Education. So uh, project sponsor, project manager, and subject matter expert all end up being the professor, kind of. Um, 
What I'm doing right here is a narrated presentation. We could have an interactive presentation where uh, if I was doing this lecture live and we were doing it on Microsoft Teams, I'm recording it at the same time, you as students could be asking me questions. Um, it's also a screen capture because that's what I'm actually doing here. I'm screen capturing my PowerPoint. And there's all kinds of simulations you can do. Um, I think simulations are more, my background with simulations are more to solve business problems than, but I think some of the activities that you can do in an adult learning situation are the games that we play, which are simulating certain aspects of business. And I know Professor Volmert uses that a lot. Uh, I've done some games on the graduate level, but not so much at the undergraduate level. And then you have a learning management system. Well, you, you're kind of experts in it. You probably had one in high school, and you probably have one now at North Park. Um, we use Canvas. We used to use Moodle. I've had an experience on Blackboard. They're kind of all the same. They have some subtle differences between them all. But they're, uh, they're really good for organizing all this. And sometimes I'm better at organizing it than not. And I know I'm not taking full advantage of it when I uh, organize a class and how I communicate with students. This online movement to online has been a real test. Uh, for everybody at North Park and probably everybody at a lot of universities around the country. So, e-learning and education. Uh, if you're in the same location, let's start here in the bottom, and the same time, that's a classroom lecture. We know that. You could have laptops at all stations. You could have presentation tools, uh, teaching theaters, audience response time, smart boards, all of these things, or you could have like Carlson, which has some of those things. If they meet at different times, uh, they could use the same class. They could have computer labs, language labs, um, you know, several sections of the same course using some of the same materials. Okay, that's interesting. But you want to look at really when we're, this is a classroom based learning. What we're interested here is in e-learning. And there's two ways, synchronous and asynchronous, as you saw in the video that I sent. Synchronous is interactive videos, virtual classrooms, chat sessions, where people are chatting all, all at the same time, audio conferencing like uh, the big blue button in Canvas or Microsoft Teams, uh, which I think I like even better, and collaborative groupware and whiteboards and all these kinds of stuff. Usually, when it comes to collaboration, students love Google Drive. That seems to be the choice. But that's synchronous online education. I'm opting out so far in this movement towards all our undergraduate classes online for this asynchronous interaction that we're having. Uh, online discussion forums, which we've been doing, in a, so basically our class has been classroom lecture and asynchronous interaction. So it's been a hybrid program of these two things. Um, we communicate by email, voicemail, uh, not so much blogs, uh, video on demand, which is what I'm creating for you right now as I'm speaking. Um, webcasting, which we haven't done any of that, but it's, if I had people listening as an audience and asking questions as we want, there could be a webcast. Any webinar now it, it turns into a video on demand because um, you don't have to attend the webinar anymore to see it. Oh, I missed it. I, I wonder what the content was. Uh, within minutes of a webinar ending, they usually send you an email with the link where you can watch it. So I could sign up for a, a webinar and watch it whenever I want instead of the time that they were actually broadcasting. So this is e-learning. So. In summary, we talked a little bit about intellectual capital, knowledge management, human behavior, e-learning, the learning management system, and corporate versus educational. I'll let Professor Papademus, if he takes you through the e-learning case and, and or the State Department wiki case. Thank you very much, and we'll talk to you soon.